I'd love to welcome you to Master Your Life Beyond the Boardroom podcast, a place for ambitious individuals to capture proud moments on who they've become. It's a discussion that finds insights, the highs and the lows on where they have been at stages in their life. A safe space to share and openly talk about their journey. So if you're on a journey yourself and you're wanting to stretch, go further and farther than you've ever thought was possible, mastering your life is something that will connect you with your identity. I'm excited to be welcoming some very interesting guests to add value to your journey. For more information and to stay in the loop on what Master Your Life is all about and gain more value, head over to www.master-your-life.co.uk. Subscribe to my newsletter and stay in the loop. Let's get to it. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Master Your Life Beyond the Boardroom, or in other words, Beyond the Workplace podcast. I have a very interesting but exciting guest with us today, and I just want to give you a bit of context, but I will let him introduce himself just in a second. But we had recently met on a men's retreat in Dubai. Now, I went in with the intention of I'm just going to go and find myself. But what I did find is a guy that is not just an operator, but somebody that has got, I mean, we was in an Uber and we was heading towards the Dubai Mall and I've never heard so much interesting stories. I feel like this could be, I mean, we know, I know, we all know that he's going to be writing a book in the future. He's an amazing guy. He's got a fantastic business. He's in the same industry as I am. He's very passionate about helping people, working within the mind and it's going to be so, so powerful to go back through time to where he is today. So I'm not going to say much more because I can talk forever. <laughs> Derek, welcome to the podcast, my man. Please introduce yourself. Luke, what is up? And absolutely delighted to be here, man. So yeah, my name is Derek Rowe, Irish man, obviously, um, living in Malta. And if anyone doesn't know where Malta is, it's a very small island in the Mediterranean, Luke. So I'm living here, basically, people ask me why I'm living here. So my son is half Maltese uh, with my ex-partner, and um, that's why I'm here. That's the only reason I'm here. But then this is what we've created, like you said, when I was talking to you, sharing some words of wisdom and some old school stories from the past. Um, this is where I've ended up, and this is where we start uh, yeah, building a legacy, we will say. <laughs> well. That is just a great intro, man. And I think we, we can really go down so many paths here. But I think yeah. with you obviously moving out to Malta, which we, we can talk about how the business has kind of been formed. I think really to start this off, let's go back to a point in your life where it wasn't probably what you would say is building that legacy that you've got right now. You can go back to any point in your life. You can go yeah. back to er childhood teens let's go to that one moment in your life that you can really remember that started this past that i know that you talk very openly about on socials now and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there yeah and i think you see everyone they're, they're unwilling to tell the truth for a lot of people like you know you'll come up against a lot of people that if you can't give yourself an honest review forget about it that you know you have to be able to go these are parts of my life i am genuine and happy with so I've had let I've definitely had a colourful past. Um and it's a big part of my business, my past, actually, my past experience. But it's like what I say to people, you know, it's great that I have an experience in um the field I'm in and that I know a lot about, but we also need to provide the solutions. And um we would go back, yeah, I think when I was about ten years old. Listen, I was a very unhappy young child. So, you know, people bring up feelings of anxiety, nervousness, whatever you want to put on it. I didn't know what it was. This is 30 years ago. Like, you know, I'm a 40 year old man now. Where the reality of my life, I wasn't happy. I was an unhappy boy from a young age. Now, so what happened 
I came from a broken home, which didn't help at that age. I'm very confused. Listen, people come from broken homes, but and I certainly don't blame my circumstances because it's up to the it's up to the individual. But when you're young, something happens. It's like something breaks. You don't know what to do. There's a lot of confusion. So I suppose for me, it was looking externally. It was looking alcohol, smoking weed, taking ease, getting into trouble. And I used to fight a lot. And it was something that's weird. I'm not a violent person. Nor am I really that aggressive. Well, it depends on who you ask. Like, I might be aggressive in some ways, right? But yeah. deep down, this wasn't me, what I was portraying. I was, you know, I said it on a couple of these talks already. It was like, I was fucking trying to create a different character, man. I was so unhappy with who I was that I had to create this other character. And this character I created, I was, because I was in, internally unhappy, it was coming out externally, and especially when I drank, you know, to be always trouble when I drank. When I was in school, there was trouble. I was school to school to school. I think it was in seven different secondary schools by the time I was 15. And then, um, you know, I lived with my dad. I lived with relations. I was sent to live with my grandmother. This was my last school I went to at 15. I was sent to another town where I'm from to live with my grandmother. And trouble follows me. I get on well. I meet the, you know, the local hoodlums, whatever you want to call them, smoking weed, skipping school. She just said, listen, basically get the fuck up. You're going back to your father's. I never want to see you again. Now, she didn't mean that she was upset. So I went back, Luke. Um... Here I am, 15. I said, right, so what, what do I do? And my next stage was I went to London when I was 16. I just said, fuck this. I had 900 quid in my pocket. I said, I'm going to London. My mother was upset. Why are you going to London? Well, I'm getting out of here. So I went. And that was an experience in itself because I had family over there. But you see, I suppose when people don't understand, they thought they were getting a delinquent. Now, I was only, I wouldn't have called myself a delinquent. I would have said I was troubled, and especially when I drank. So I went to stay with one of my uncles for a week, and, you know, we smoked a bit of weed, drank a bit of whiskey, whatever. I had a a new family, so, like, you know, I had to move. So I um, went online. It was was either online or in a newspaper. I can't really remember. But there was a job, an opening for a cellar man. So a cellar man in a pub is basically a fella in the cellar and pull points. That's what a cellar man is. So I was in um, Finsbury Park in London, for anyone that knows London. Pretty rough place. So I rocked up anyway, and it was an Irish guy who owned it, and he goes, you have experience. Now, I'm 16, so I'm portraying myself as 19. Yeah, man, I have two years' experience at home. So it was a live-in job, so I thought this was great. <laughs> Moved in, and I was basically meant to, the next morning, you know, get the place ready. I didn't have a fucking clue what I was doing. So one of the chefs, a real cockney guy, came down. He says, you don't know what the fuck you're doing, do you? And I said, no, man, I have no clue. <laughs> and he started laughing. He said, I'll show you. So that was great for a couple of weeks. But again, you know, the older guys at the bar, you know, let's go out drinking, let's go out taking ease. That lasted a couple of weeks. So then I moved from there. Where did I move to next? Kilburn. Um, blagged my way into a house there. Got a job in a nightclub in the city centre. Yeah, I was just blackguard and I was, you know, that lasted a few months. I wasn't paying my rent, I'd skip. I'd move somewhere else. I moved to Wilson Green. Now I partied everywhere I went. I met some dodgy fuckers. I was in some dodgy situations. And I lasted a year late before. Do you know what? I said, I've had enough of this shit. I'm going home. And I rang my mother, said I'm coming home. Came home. Father said, right, straight to work. So that was it. Tough man, my father. But I'll tell you, you know, he, he, his, a lot of good values came from him, which was hard work, right? He taught all of my brothers and sisters the same. So I went to work and I was there, you know what, this isn't for me. I, I want to. Now, I was selling drugs, by the way, from about 14 years of age, selling a little bit of hash and skill. So I always had that in mind. You know, I want to be a drug dealer. Was my, that was my ambition. So that will go to show you where my mind was at as a young child, that this was the, the character I was wanting to build. So. It sort of dabbled back into that again, selling ease and stuff like that. You know, we were doing okay. And that's then what I went full-time at about 18, 19. I went full-time selling drugs. Um, so I went from hashies to kilos of cocaine, basically. Um, in my young 20s, uh, <laughs> I could, I, do you want me to keep going? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, just before we, yeah, I guess, flow into the 20s, yeah. just when you've spoken about at 10 years old, yeah. internally inside, you weren't happy. Externally, you know, it, it was kind of showing that you weren't, like with obviously your actions and stuff. What do you honestly feel brought you to just be or, or let this anger go out? What What made that happen? Because obviously every trauma childhood will have a certain yeah. thing that they hold on to of it was because I was neglected or maybe I wasn't heard, listened to, whatever it may be. What was it for you? I think it was like, you know, you see, we were spoiled. All of us were spoiled, but we were spoiled for reasons to make up for other things. You see, I suppose if you look at Ireland as a whole, the whole Catholic thing back then, and you're going back, you know, I'm 14 now, so you're going, you're going back many years, whereas we're a very Catholic family, but heavy drinking. Like if you look at the, my father, especially mother, mother's family, there was there was quite a large number of the minutes of my aunties and uncles, and they were all heavy drinkers, and some of them heavy drug users in the end, and but all from staunch Catholic backgrounds, so, sort of tough backgrounds. So and you looked at it on one side, we had everything, but we didn't have emotionally, we had nothing. You see, so I suppose when my mother left, even though I wasn't. I just wasn't the way a young boy should be. I knew I didn't have the confidence. I didn't have a lot of things. When I look back now, I can identify that now and go, okay, clear to see if, if I, I would see that in my son now. But that's just the way it was in a household like that. I don't think there was another way. And you see, that's no one's fault, Luke. That's, this, these programs and patterns are passed down through generations of families. So was there a right way or wrong? We just thought this was the way. Do you know I would I bring my son to the pub every weekend? No, I wouldn't. But we were in the pub most weekends. But that was normal because, you know, we'd go out and play and we had fun. I have some great memories of that. But the point you asked me, I would say my mother left and I didn't know she had left. And I'd found out in a certain way, which I wasn't happy about. And I think I just closed in and I just became very, I would say I became a loner. And I was only 10 or 11 now. So I became a bit of a loner. And it simmered and fucking simmered within me. Mm -hmm. And to get obsessional about being a drug dealer, you know, people might find that strange, but I had to create something because obviously I didn't like how I was feeling. I didn't fucking like what I was seeing in the mirror, essentially. And uh, this is the, the character I created. And so that would have been the biggest turning point, but there would have been a build up to that. I'm not here to criticize people, but this is, you know, people want to hear somebody's story because we all have a story we all have valuable life experience but it's it's only valuable if we change change the course of the future by what we do in the present yeah i think just what you shared right at the end there is definitely something for the listeners to to feel and think about especially with what we're doing now to to create the future but that though derek is again not something that i mean obviously i've I've only known you for a short period of time. That was something that I'd not known that it was that when you're, I mean, obviously we share yeah. it now when, when your mum obviously left, it was a build up inside. It simmered, it got, got a bit more. And then like you said, though, in your life, it was the normal. It was the environment that you was exposed to. It was maybe the people that was just within your circle at the time. So it didn't necessarily feel, I guess. And I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, it probably didn't feel out of, out of sync it felt that this is a this is a path that i can create and go down it's okay yeah it's like um you know what's normal you grow up it's like you don't know any better it's like you know we have a map and if you're confined to a certain map of the world in a certain area and you don't know there's a bigger world out there you just think this is it this is it and you see with that culture is a big thing and you know especially back then in ireland you know because we were we were going to mass every Sunday, you know, the, the, the typical Catholic family. But, you know, over consumption of drink was normal. So this was normal to me. Now, is it, when I look back now, I go, that's very abnormal. If I was every weekend, come on, Leon, we're going to the pub, you go outside and play. Here, here's, a couple of, here's a couple of quid <laughs> while, while we drink. And, you know, there was a, I suppose, exposed to that. I wouldn't do it and nor do my brothers and sisters expose their kids to it. So that'll tell you a thing or two. And then, I suppose as you get to the 12, 13 years old, you know, you're a certain way. Maybe you're not happy. It's clear to see someone's not happy and they might be a little bit aggressive and that comes out in school. And what are you going to attract in school? You're going to attract like-minded individuals. And from about 12, I did attract like-minded individuals that were from broken homes, that were unhappy and that were angry. So that's 
that's a fucking mix in itself. <laughs> that's a mix for pure disaster, um, which in turn was disastrous, but also I think it's how I protected myself as well, man, from actually having to feel anything I didn't want to feel. So it was a lot easier to do certain things without much feeling than to actually have to face up to my reality. And I think this is a point for a lot of people. Most people are not facing up to the reality. They'll keep doing it, but they'll, it's, it's nearly low-level operating, low-level thinking, which will lead to the habits, vices. And that can be food, man. It can be alcohol, drugs. It can be sex. It can be a whole range of different things, man. But unless you're able to get to a stage and go, Jesus Christ, like, I, I want to change. It's not having a need to, I want to. I do not like these aspects of my life. Nothing's going to change. Nothing is going to happen. So, um, yeah, it, like, environment is everything. Um, you know, we will have generational program and how we look. You know, you will look like your father or your mom. They would have looked like their mother and father. We would have taken on a lot of their habits and stuff whether that's good or bad now we can change all of this and you know it's something i know you show people it's something i certainly show people that we can change our circumstances but we have if we do not like our circumstances we can change them but when you're that age <coughs> luke it's i didn't know what was going on i was very confused i was going like what the fuck is wrong with me why do i feel like this um i'm not happy and i didn't really know why now it's easy to step back now and go well you know, I, I was a, a young kid. And if my child was like that, you would identify it pretty quickly to go, you know, is, is there anyone to blame? I'm not here to blame anyone. But, you know, there, there, there's the right way and there's the wrong way about doing things. I really like that. So just as, as a question from my side, then, when you was in your early teens and yeah. these things was happening, you was obviously being around like-minded people, it felt, I guess, safe in a way to be around those people. Were you numb to feelings or did you actually feel it? Like, so for example, you see obviously teenage kids. I know when I was back at school, there'd be kids that just zero fucks given, you know, they just do something and they're like, like, it's like they had nothing in there. It just, they just did it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like at the end of the day, I was always causing trouble. No matter where I went, I, I caused trouble. Do not give me drink. I would cause double the damage and double the trouble with drink. So, you know, I was one of those that didn't go to school. We, one of those in first year, so what, we were 13, so I don't know what it is in the UK, but we call it first year. So after primary school, you go to first year, smoking weed, and then, oh, you know, going to sell hash in school. And, you know, they didn't want me there. Basically, it was quite a large school. They called my father down one day and they said, out of all the people in this school, there's three people that are leaving today, and your son is one of them. <laughs> he is a troublemaker. Um, I was their grant, so you know, I did a bit of work, and then I went to another school, went to another school. Um, as I said, this went on till I was 15, and I ended up with my grandmother um, in a certain town that wouldn't have been good for me either because the environment there wasn't great, the surrounding we will say the people within the community and you know somebody like me is going to latch on to a certain type of person and that's what i did so everywhere i went it, it felt like felt like a fucking failure and i was there jesus christ then i went to london anything could have happened to me there I was in crack houses so i was fucking living with crackheads <laughs> i was flowing from house to house blagging my way around the place but it is still in a good experience when i look back now would i want it for you know, my son, no. Would you want it for your lovely daughter? No. <laughs> but it's what I've been through. And um, it is what it is right now, as I sit here and tell you. But this is this is powerful because when we get further into this, it's going to be, I mean, you've shared your story openly. You know, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know you, you're, you're very good at that. Um, people will be able to know more about it. But I think just, when we get to the point of what brought you out, you know, what was that flip of the switch or the trigger or just the change, yeah. whatever, that's going to be really key because it's good to understand this context. I mean, if we're now going to leave in school, like you say, your early 20s, let, let's get into that era because I think that's where, let's be honest, and I know this because when I had um, kind of finished my football and I'd kind of come back home, you know, a lot of my friends was dabbling 
You know, yeah. it was it was every time at New Year's Eve, it was I probably was the only person in this nightclub that was drinking a red stripe can. I think everybody was off their <laughs> nut, you know, like looking at me. Uh, you know, gone out. Um, so I think really t- t- tell us a bit more about what happened after that then when you got into that age bracket. Yeah, so we will say 19 to 21 is when I started making decent money out of drugs. So maybe making 10, 12 grand a month, right? So not bad for a young lad. You know, I'm floating around. I mean, there's me and a few involved in it and I'm not the only one. So that was the money I used to take out of it. And it was a good system, but I knew it wasn't a long-term system. We would end up getting caught at some, some stage. So, basically, we used to sell these in a nightclub. So, there used to be three of us used to do it. Um, and I did end up getting caught. I went out with the wrong person, and I took way too much cocaine. And I was a fucking idiot. And basically, I got caught, and I had 90, 90 ADs. Now, that's jail time, right? So, wow. I said, fuck, now, man, what am I going to do? So I was advised to go to this solicitor, right? Uh, I won't tell you his name. He's dead now anyway, but he's a very good solicitor. And he said, what happened? I said, well, listen, to come here in 1980s, I was brought to a certain uh, guard station in Dublin. I uh, you know, got a few slaps in there. And they actually left me a bag of coke. They didn't take it, so I took some coke, and I think there was a couple of V's left, so I took them when I was in the cell in my boxer shorts at a little party, right? So I got booted out of there anyway, got a taxi, went home, said, fuck. So found this solicitor anyway. Went into, he said, right, you know, it's going to be, it's going to cost this amount. You know, it wasn't a small amount. It was, at the time, it was about a thousand quid. So we're going back 20, 20, 21 years, right? So he said, leave it with me. So I didn't really hear anything. This was going on for about a year. So at that stage, then I said, fuck this, I'm getting into wholesale and drugs. So I was buying, you know, a couple of kilos of cocaine, kilos of hash, um, 5,000 bags, you know, a, a bag with 5,000 these type of thing. So I, you know, farm them out to three or four people. So me and my girlfriend were in my father's house up, uh, we were partying. She looked out, she said, there's fucking cops at the door. <laughs> uh, we had... Quite a bit of cocaine in the room. So I thought, fuck, getting raided, man. So we started firing the stuff out the window. And it, it wasn't anyway. What it was, Luke, they were there with the summons for the 1980s, right? So my sister had let them in, then handed me the summons, Greg. So I'd given it to the solicitor. He said, lovely. So I said, what do you mean by lovely? He said, just leave it with me. I have to look through this. So there was, a, it was about three months from the court day. He said, your grand with this i said but it's 98 days i'm not fucking grand so don't worry about it so on the day of i met one of his colleagues who brought me to court he said listen this will be a formality so what happened was this the summons was 24 hours out of date so it was struck out the, the, there was no conviction it was struck out right so i was absolutely fucking blessed so then i went hell for leather then at drug dealing for the next seven <laughs> seven years i was a heavy consumer of cocaine um Listen, if you had a look at my life back then, there was a, there was a few of us. You know, we drove top of the range cars. I had my own house at 21. I traveled the world. I was the most unhappy person, Luke. When I think back and look back at that person, I was dying inside. I was heavy consumption of cocaine, very paranoid about everybody, very paranoid about life. Um, couldn't go anywhere unless I was fucking high. I it ended up with me sitting inside and not leaving my house for many days and I'd snort by myself, I'd turn my phone off. And all I was doing at the time was on my phone doing everything. I didn't have to see the drugs, I just needed to collect the money that was it. And here's me driving around then um I had a BMW M five at the time, which switched to reward a lot of money, and I would drive to collect my social welfare. That's how much I didn't give a fuck. I would have wow. Dolce Gamana shirts five six hundred quid and my mate at the time had an x5 and he used to drive to his social welfare post office and collect his doll too we did not care um <laughs> but that was <laughs> that was reality you know that was that was life i thought that was it my family didn't really want to know me they were in fear um again i wasn't one of these people and i want to make it clear i was not out on the street committing crimes I used this purely to make money and to take drugs. I, I was making a lot of money at the time, and it was, I was not one of these fellas out causing trouble. 
I had a good system in place. I had good people on board, solid people that were buying my drugs in larger quantities. And um, that was it. And yeah, my life was a little fucked up. Like, so for my whole twenties, I'd seen the world. I would could go to South America tomorrow for a month. And what would I do there? I would do the exact same thing when I went over there. Fuck it, I need to go to Thailand. Fuck it, I go to Thailand. I would just consume drugs. I go anywhere. It was just heavy consumption, wanting to basically kill myself. I was that unhappy. I had everything from the outside, but I had nothing on the inside. I was black. I was fucking dark, man. And, and in between all of this, by the way, just wanted to finish about the whole drugs. Drugs yeah, brings yeah. nothing. I'm not glorifying drugs here. This is you. You. I'm on here to tell a story. Um, and this was my life. You know, I I can't change my story. But it brings nothing. I've lost a lot of people due to drugs. Um, you know, I've had one of my best friends hang himself. Another guy was shot dead. There's a lot of lads doing time. So I'm very blessed that, that I'm still here. But again, you know, nothing. there's no good outcome out of that long term, whether it's drug dealing, consumption of drugs. It's going to end in misery at some stage. There is no look attached to it. There is no anything that is of any... The product is always going to be misery at the end of it. That was... I'm glad you shared that last little bit, to be honest, about the people that you was in it with, what's kind of happened to those. Obviously, you've come out grateful, got a bit of a clean slate, been able to, I guess, have a new path and a new venture. So seven, seven years. You say seven years of your life. So basically, it was that that type of drug dealing where what what I did was, I, I have no problem saying I had four to five people who would buy X amount off me a month. So I would have to do fuck off. I would have two people drop it there. I would just have to collect the money. Chad, too much money, too much cocaine. And I'm at that age, 21, 22, and I got away with this then for years. And, um, you know, people fucking, my family didn't respect me. Like They just didn't. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Do you know what I mean? You're, you're acting a cunt, basically. Like, do you know, I came home one day, um, I was living with my girlfriend and my mother said, I'll bring your washing with you. And, you know, you'd have the bag with the washing. And um, I was upstairs there. Fuck. I forgot I'd put 20 grand in cash at the bottom of the washing. And here's my mother going, what the fuck is this? I was there. <laughs> I, got, I got loaned out a local credit union. And what could you say? Like, you can't really say anything. You know, you're driving cars that are, quite clearly expensive you're not working you're wearing expensive clothes you're going on holidays <laughs> it's like you know we know what you're doing type of thing so i wasn't i didn't it didn't phase me i just didn't care because i didn't care because i had no respect for myself that's why i didn't care like and i was still going to the gym and stuff um but yeah it was uh it was a, it was a crazy time it, did I have good times? I had some good times, but I think the bad outweighed the good by, by far because you have to understand for a lot of it, I was by myself taking cocaine because I didn't want to be around anyone. And it brought a lot of trouble because when you get that paranoid, you get paranoid about everybody in your life. They're, they're out to get you. There's someone, you know, your fucking girlfriend is talking to some other fella and you're always accusing people of stuff. Um, so it's not a nice thing. I've I've heard that a lot about you know, consumption of drugs, the paranoia yeah. that, you know, most people would probably sit on their own, uh, taking it at some stage, especially if they have a bit more of an overdose, it's an addiction. So just going on to that point then, so f- so how long was you in the drug game? So we would say you started out there, you're selling scores, like 20, 20 euro scores or 20 pound scores a time. It's only small little lumps of hash. So from 14 till 28. 14 years. Wow. That's a long time, huh? It's a long time, man. I've, I've seen a lot in that time, man. You know, a lot of, lot of it bad. Some good, but listen, you're, you're, you're on the other side. <laughs> so, you know, you, you're, you're involved with people who, you know, most of the people I knew, they're sound, but you're going to come across, when you're heavy consuming, you're going to make some bad decisions as well. And I started, at the end, I was making bad decisions. I was, um, I got into gambling in the end. That's what finished me, by the way, gambling. I was going to say... It wiped me out. I was just going to go on to that. What, when you were talking about decisions, bad decisions, what was one of the worst decisions you made? 
Yeah, so basically at that, so I was at a good, a good place if you looked at me. You know, I had money. But I didn't have anything else. Like, that's all I had. And, you know, the recession came. Um, it would have happened in the UK as well as Ireland. So that would have been saved. So 13, 14 years ago, the recession hit. So basically, my product was cocaine. People can't afford cocaine, but they can't afford weed. So, you know, the lads were moving into weed, my friends. And my, the grow houses, this is where the money's on. I was there. Yeah, yeah, I was still consuming heavy. But I got into gambling. I was in Australia and Melbourne at the Grand Prix and I fucking found the casino. And I said, fucking man, I like gambling now. And then I kept going. I bought equipment to grow weed and all. And I got a house and I just didn't do anything with it. And this was now going on a year. I was fucking losing thousands in this fucking these casinos i was gambling on horses and uh, i just became an absolute fucking degenerate gambler uh, <laughs> that's all i can say within 18 months i had uh pretty much lost everything in 18 months so this will also show you how self-destructive i was because any time i remember when i was younger and i would do well i had to self-destruct it i, I couldn't cope with good feelings and the same with this. I'm not saying it was a good feeling to have money. And again, I'm not glorifying it. But it was the whole, that button, that internal instinct to go self-destruct, press that fucking button. That's what gambling was for me. Because with gambling, you could lose everything in a night. There is no limits to gambling. And um, that's what took me to the edge. And when I'd say it took me to the edge, I really didn't want to live, man. Like, yours, I'm having to beg my mother, can I come home at 29 years old? Like, from having that life for so long to begging my mother, can I come home? She's still in, now my mother's long gone now, but she still would have been in some fear going, well, I heard what happened your friend, all these things, even though nothing would have happened, but in her mind, I had built up such a fucking fear in her from, from all the previous years that um, here I am, uh, I'm, you know, I'm nearly wanting to fucking rob people at this stage to go gamble. It's crazy, crazy shit, man. Yeah, just the fact that in, like you said, the 18 month period, you had what was such a high, you know, had everything and then it just suddenly just disappeared. Um, that That is mad. And then the fact that, you, you know, you said that you self-destruct. So just in in the gambling world, obviously, you know, we, I've, I've dabbled with casinos. I mean, I'm not, you know, I bet on football. We all do that kind of stuff. What do you think kind of kept you hooked in? Like what, what? brought you to like i'm just going to keep going and going and going i'm just i'm just curious yeah. more than anything well it's that that compulsion um it's like rock i'll give you an example with the casino especially right i'm an intelligent man right i mean i i know what i'm doing so i i was actually decent at playing cards but what i liked was the buzz I needed that dopamine, and my dopamine needed to be high, and this was the problem with cocaine, I had to take too much of it at the end, I had to snort five, seven grams to get what I used to get out of a fucking gram, and that's a lot of cocaine, by the way, okay, to be snorting, so, you know, I would have had a lot of health trouble in my 20s from overconsumption of cocaine especially, so it's that dopamine, it's it's the winning and not being able to get the fuck off the table and go home and have a good night, no, I had to stay, I had to be that one, I was still taking some cocaine, drinking and it was that it was not only the that pattern of self-destruction but it was that utter disregard for fucking any self-respect any respect for money any respect for anything and i didn't genuinely give a fuck and here it is going out and the more money that went out the worse it made me feel but i still kept going back for more because this is how i had operated for so long and now here i am at my worst stage in since I was 10 years old, so from 10 to 29, what's that, 19 fucking years. I'm now in a worse position because of this thing called gambling, but it was going to happen one way or another because if it didn't happen, I wouldn't have then took the next step, even though there's still another two or three chapters to, 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 to get me here, but I wouldn't have, um, okay, had some realizations. I wouldn't have met certain people you know, it could have went the other way. It's like I have the first cousin I had mentioned he took his own life. Um, we were very close. We did a lot of work together when we were in our late teenage years and our 20s. And he had enough, man, as well, you know, because that world can do that to you. Yeah, that's that's really interesting what you shared there. And I know 
anybody again tuning in onto this that's had any sort of addiction or or, or use drugs, they they will relate to that like what? a million a million percent, whatever level that it was at. I mean, so just going on to the next step because I think there's good context there on where you was yeah. obviously, you know, the life that you had led. So what what was the the shift? What was that? Eye open moment or trigger to be like, here's my new start. Here's the fresh, clean slate, and then moved you into. I mean, obviously, we know you're an entrepreneur. You're a great yeah. business owner, but what was that first step? So here I am, not a panic on. What am I doing? So I would get my social welfare. I'd gamble at that day. This <laughs> just went on for months, right? So there was a Christmas. It's gone back 11 years ago. So I think I had about 500 quid and I was all set for buying presents for everybody, right? This is a new star. Sad as my life is, you know, I can give a little bit something to my family. Oh, oh let's just pop into the casino, 100 quid. Gone, 500. <laughs> so my mother and brother were having a drink when I got home and I decided to uh, have a drink too. And then I decided to drink a whole bottle of vodka raw while they went to bed oh. and then um, i decided to attack my brother um break up my father's house <laughs> yeah i uh, go on an absolute mad one and i uh, got locked up so <laughs> then <dead. laughs> that was that was my christmas folks so roll on um a while later i was in with either probation officer at the time so i was facing other charges too and uh I just said, this is fucked up. I don't even want to live. He said, man, I believe in you. And I started crying. I said, no. I said, no one's ever said that to me. So would you go to treatment? I said, I'll fucking do what it takes. So I went to treatment. But I had, you have to understand, I had a massive ego from where I, the world I was coming from. I thought I was better than, here's me and I had nothing. But I'm still thinking I'm better than you cunts. I am fucking better. And I want protein powders in there. And I'm there with there, man. You're living in a different world. That's not happening. <laughs> so I went in. <laughs> what I thought I was getting on good <laughs> in the treatment center, you know, I was asked, I was brought in for a meeting two weeks with, with the head guy. And he goes, um, listen, man, you're not doing well here. I think you should go. I said, go where? Nobody fucking wants me. You know what I mean? Um, the last time I was at home, all hell broke loose. So I don't know. Where do I go? And he said, well, you know, there's certain things going on here. You're building relationships. Uh, there's a couple of ladies. That's not acceptable. And I said, I haven't done anything, but we know what you're doing. I said, I haven't done anything. Because I was good at manipulating as well, you see. You had to be a good manipulator um, in doing what I was into. So I stayed anyway. And it was never going to be enough a month in residential treatments here. You're basically in a house. So they said, listen, Derek, there's another house called Carmela. It's in another city close to here. Would you go there? It's it's six anywhere from six months to a year. I said, sure, yes, I will go. So I was at this stage. I had had I turned thirty. No, I was twenty nine. This was November, November, just the, the year before I turned thirty. And um, it was basically you could call it a halfway house with ten other men, troubled men from all walks of life, ranging from eighteen all the way to I think it was sixty, sixty eldest, right? Um, there was counselors in the house. We'd have meetings. There'd be nurses there minding us in the evening. We had a curfew. You'd have to be home by 10. You know, we did some basic stuff like fucking woodwork, go to the gym. But I always liked the gym. So I used to bring the lads to the gym and I led, tried to lead by example as much as I could. Taught them what food was about. And, uh, you know, I gained, you know, I gained better leadership skills to a quality leader rather than leading people the wrong way. Then. The guys didn't like that, the counselors, because they were now listening to me, the people in the house. <laughs> so we'd have these meetings. And, um, I was there, what do we do? So we had a few fallings out, but in the end, we all we were all a solid family. And you know what? We were all very happy. We didn't have a pot to piss. We had 100 quid after paying the house 100. And life was good. We were clean. We were sober. You know what? We were in the gym. We might have had fuck all, but we were still on the right path. So I spent, it was close to a year there, 11 months. So then when you get out, they provide you with an apartment. Great, I had no TV, so I was reading books, still clean. And um, I stayed off like fucking drinking drugs, I think for about 18 months. And one of my friends came and I said, oh, let's smoke a bit of weed. And he said, oh, it was like fucking, well, I won't. I did. It was fine. Then I opened the gym out of nothing. So basically I said to everyone, I'm going to open the gym. 
And I said, you're full of shit. How are you going to open the gym? You're going to have money. Wait and see. So I knew the guy who owned my apartment complex. I said, you know anybody in the city who just has a room? So he's had a do. So he brought me down and met the guy. And listen, Luke, you wouldn't have put a, a stray dog in there. Like, it, was a, it was a snake. <laughs> but I said, would you put a toilet in it and just sweep it? Yeah, yeah. So I told him my story. He wanted 400 quid, 400 euros. So up front, he didn't want to deposit. So I went to the local charity, which is the Vincent de Paul. I said, listen, told him my story. He said, no, man. You're not giving me 400 quid. So I went down, I went down, I went down. No, no, no. And eventually, an old lady came up and said, listen, from, from the Vincent de Paul, we're going to give you the 400 George Great. Now I needed to get straight to business, so I had no equipment. And there was a year waiting list to get a grant for, I think it was, believe it was a thousand quid. So I said, fuck this. I went up to the office, walked into the guy's office. I'm Derek Rowe. He was there. What are you doing? Like, you need an appointment. I said, listen, man, this is an emergency. You know, I've got this building. I've only a month to fucking rent to need to make money. Can you help me? I will. So I got a thousand. Got some equipment and I just started doing classes. And that built and built. And I had my girlfriend, my, my son's mother at the time. She had moved over in the meantime from Malta. And we had saved up a couple of grand. And I was following this business coach at the time. And I said, fuck, man. He's doing a special offer, six weeks, one to one. It's two grand. So that's all the money we have there. Now, when I mean all the money was, we had 20 quid in the electricity box and we had enough food for a few days. She said, just give it to him, fuck it. And I gave it to him and I went all in. Fine uh-huh. night that, I went from there to making money again, employing personal trainers. And so what does Derek do? Goes back on the coke and uh, destroyed absolutely fucking everything over the next four years family left me business went to shit you know i was in my office snorting drugs all day basically <laughs> while my clients <laughs> while, my, while my clients and guys that worked for me were downstairs they all knew what i was doing like and i was on doing live videos on facebook coke down my head <laughs> you know i was going home and you know, Amy was there. You're high. No, I'm not high. And I was high all the time. They left. My life fell apart. As I said, I built the gym back up. I was still taking coke. And then four years ago is when it all changed. When I met a mentor who showed me how to get this right. Because you have to understand, I've been to rehabilitation centers, doctors, therapists since I was a young boy. All my life gone to therapy. And there was never a solution. Until I met this man, and he's still my mentor to this day, who showed me how to use this. So that was up to four years ago. Wow. Mm. So that that's that's really powerful there. That you know you shared that you kind of come out, you stopped, and then fell back into it again. Even though again externally people would look on video scene because I know obviously you've got that persona where you want to listen to you. You know you've got that leadership man in you. So then it's it's just like, again, you're just upstairs. You're just like, yeah, I'm just sniffing cocaine. What the hell kind of thing. So how did how did you find this mentor? Like what brought you to him to go, I'm going to get, because is, is that the person you spent 2,000 on or is that somebody else? No, that was somebody else. That was oh, okay. like, started me out, we would say, in the business world. So right. this is now five years later. So basically, I was recommended to him and uh, eventually this bit the bullet time was right i said what's wrong with you I said I, I said i'm depressed and i have anxiety he went what i said what what are you on about <laughs> he was there like this and he was looking he was there where is it i said where the fuck is what man i started sitting up he said where's your anxiety and depression and stuff you're talking about i said i have it he says he started laughing i was getting a little bit angry you know and uh, then i just started laughing i said you're fucking right man i said i think i'm being you know listen he he taught like this man taught me so much. He's like a father figure in my life now, right? And he was being funny, but not being funny to break that state because I was in such a bad state. <clears throat> that it was just doom and fucking gloom going around the place all the time. If someone asked me how oh, grand and grand like this, head down, and you know, life just wasn't good. So it took me, Luke, the reality, it, it, it took me years. And it, this is years later. This is four, four, four and a half years later. So it took me years to um, get to where I am, but to be, Jesus Christ, you know what? Life's okay now. Life's good. I like life. Whereas I didn't like life for 36 years. I just didn't. 
I was mm. angry all the time. So this guy taught me the inner workings of the mind, you know, the whole reprogramming. I'm, this is what I teach people. Like, and now obviously I've invested a lot of money. Like when I'm talking about invest money, I'm talking, Jesus Christ, at least 300,000 in my 30s on personal development. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's a lot of money. Like, yeah, to, yeah. To invest because I've given him a lot of money. It's four and a half years of working with somebody. That's only one. So I've invested in other things. Now, some good, some bad, but this was one of my golden investments and it, it is what it takes like listen you know we have to be willing to invest to learn more so we can apply more so we can help more and um it's not for everybody because that it always comes with a risk but i think for the likes of me and you we we are attuned to taking risks you know because without taking a risk we're never going to know and even if it doesn't work out it's a test and we go fuck you know what actually it's not a failure because what is failure failure is feedback so we can move forward so i learned a lot from him um and then if we want to fast forward i said i like this shit i like this i like fitness too but i like this i said right i'm going to test this now and remember a guy you used to go to school with fuck i didn't even know he was into coal i don't know whether i maybe mentioned it to a few people what i was doing he turned up in my house man i thought someone was robbing me gaff man i said what the fuck is banging music on and here he was man basically fucked I said i need your help i said right let's test it so i took him oh, excuse me it's coming coming away from a flu so this is the reason you're all good yeah and um there's three people then i helped great results so i got better and better at my craft and then covid hit uh i couldn't come to see my son in malta so i had five months at home and i said right i had the gym and clothes and i don't want to have I want to go online so i focused online of i suppose upskilling getting better in my craft working with these then july 2020 i moved here but i went online properly a month before and I built and I built and built i suppose to where i am now well we're always building you know human beings we have to build towards something so you know when i say build and build that's what we do because for me that is essentially living that we need something to build towards and um here i am in malta now i'm pretty happy yeah you know, life is life for us all. It's not easy for anybody, but at the end of the day, we we can either, you know, if we don't like our circumstances, we change them. It's as simple as that. But we have to be willing. We have to be able. We have to want to cut through the shit that's in front of us. Because as you know, Luke, nobody gets a free fucking right. Any day, life isn't always going to be easy. And I believe some people need a little bit of a push and to be told this is the truth. Life's not easy. You were going to be faced with challenges. You better be ready. I think that is so, so good, especially where you just honestly said, look, 36 years of my life, I wasn't happy. Yeah. And the fact that you had found somebody and you again took that risk and it's been four years of a journey, right? That a process of you rewiring the brain, fixing whatever it is that you needed fixing. But that in itself is a commitment that, you know, most probably aren't willing to, have patience with so you know as you started this journey and you was going through it was there any moments that you was like ah oh, this is just I'm, I know I'm going to go back to back I know I'm going to go back to cocaine or you, you know what what started to change in you that you thought I'm, I'm going to do this I'm going to create this because I find it honestly so interesting how mm. you've you built this empire this entrepreneurial mindset from where you was Listen, you have to understand, right? Thirty six years. It's it's literally. I have to I have to work on this daily. Like, listen, I was maybe an odd case. I would say for you know Michael is an MMA mentor. It, there was a lot of work involved. He, he stood by me. Like I went back to Cork many times at the start. Many times it was like fuck, man. I was like, it's like I was by myself. What do I do? I can't face up. This is my fucking reality. I don't seem to be doing well. I keep fucking up. You know, I fucked up the best relationship. My son's not in the same country. All of this. So I was going back. But I was slowly making improvements. I couldn't see them. I was in such a mindset of, I couldn't see the light, literally. I could, couldn't could fucking see positivity out of life. So when I speak, you see, I know what it feels like to be at the worst end. But I also know what it takes to build, to craft, 
a better future, but we have to do it from our present moment. We can't go live in dream world and go, oh, great, this is what I'm going to be. Like, you know, you got to be, that's what I said, you have to roll up your sleeves and do the work. So it does take a lot of failures. So see, a lot of people, Luke, they're not willing to fail. There's, a, there's three types of people. There's the person, they're not willing, they'll talk shit. They won't do it. There's the second type, they'll do so. Oh my God, that's a failure. Not, not closed. And then there's the third that goes, well, I have no option, but I had no option at that stage. I had burnt so many bridges up to 36. I didn't have an option anymore. So it was better I had no option. And I said, this is the this is the path. Plenty of fuck ups in the last four years, believe me. This wasn't, it was most farthest away from a smooth road to get here you could imagine. But I've got here and what's changed is I just did a little bit more. I just adjusted a little more. I just applied a little bit more. And then when I, when you were like you, you, what's my drug is seeing other people fucking step up, man. My drug is seeing people thrive. And that's it. And listen, I'm people, a lot of people won't like my approach. I really don't care because it's not enough for everybody and I'm not promoting it. But I know what works and I also have an understanding of that life. I have an understanding of how the mind works. I have an understanding of how the physical body works. And then I bring it together because you see, I've been through all the system and that system failed me. And I know the people that come to me, the system failed them too. So, you know, you, I'm not, I will throw stones if I feel like at other systems because I've been there. So I speak from experience. But a lot of people can come online and speak a lot of bullshit that they've no experience about. And people will see through that where, you know, if life, you know, again, it does come down to people are wanting, um, they're wanting something for nothing. And you know this from the gym. Oh, I've done two weeks and why haven't I lost five kilos? Shut the fuck up. Like what are you, do you know what I mean? This type of attitude, it doesn't work like that. It takes a year. This is what I say. And I don't like when I say it, it takes a year. What? A year? What do you mean? Yeah, it takes a year. If you want to build better quality habits that are a little bit more automatic, you can build consistency in 12 weeks, no problem. But a year will change a life. A year will change how the thought process works. A year will change a lot of things and will enhance a lot of areas of your life. So, uh, yeah, listen, I'm blessed to be here. Um, you know, my son is happy which is great because for a lot of people who don't learn what I knew, they inflict other people with their bullshit. And I could have eased, I, I did do that when he was younger. I did that up till he was three or four in my presence of seeing me lose the plot, we will say. Uh, and uh, not a nice thing because, you know, I grew up in that as well. And uh, now, you know, his life has changed. I will only remain changed and people will only remain changed by staying and sticking to the process that works because it's fucking very easy to go back. It's always there. That life is always there. No matter what it is, no matter what vice it is, because everyone has a vice and uh, whatever that is, that does not go away. So this is when I talk about living and I talk about moving forward. Like it's essential we have an outcome. This is, you know, this is, what a human mind needs something to lock on to ah nice okay fuck now we achieved that oh now my self-belief is better oh i actually respect myself let's move on what else can we achieve that that is so good man like i just love how you've kind of put it together though in terms of i know people that like say tuning in they're just going to be thinking well this is mental how you've had that clarity to break free and you, you're still admitting that it's still there. It's still easy to go back to, but you, you've broke free from it. You're now living a, a life with purpose, meaning. I mean, you're living in Malta. You're on the marina, beautiful place, great weather all year round. You've got an unbelievable business. You've got a clear message. And you've created something that anybody that would probably have seen Derek Rowe at 36 years old, what <laughs> are the odds? What are the chances that you would be in this position at 40 years old running an unbelievable business, you know? And just on that note, with it being that four years of commitment, and I guess you've been asked this question a lot, what, what would you be saying to somebody out there that it doesn't have to be 
like an addiction that you've had, but oh, just, yeah. you know, just something that has maybe been like holding them back or been, a, I don't know, a, a nemesis for 10 years, yeah. 15 years. What, what would you say to them to like break free from it or just at least like you say, start working on the mindset? Well, listen, first and foremost, you have to be around people who are a couple of steps ahead. It's, this isn't, this isn't a, oh, come join Luke's or mine coaching program. But at the end of the day, this is how I fucking did it. I gave money to somebody to learn what they know. That's how I did it, right? If I was left to my own devices, I would not be here. I would not. And you see, this is the problem with people. They have one way of thinking. Now, there's nothing right or wrong because that's their map. That's, that's their reality. They don't, it was like when I said when I was young, I didn't think there was a way out. So they are operating like this. They're like sheep. Go, just go out on a weekend, Monday to Friday, go to the pub. Oh, I, I, I have fun while I drink and stuff. No, you don't. You're having fun. You're, you're overweight and you're fat. You're not having fun. Sorry, you're pretending that, that you're happy. You're not happy. We know this, right? But no one wants to say this. But that's the truth. This is a pattern. And you see, Luke, the pattern is that strong and that program is running. That habit is so fucking entwined in this person. It takes a monumental effort. And this is what people don't want to hear. It takes sacrifice. It takes falling on your face. It takes failure. But you have to take that failure and go, mm, okay, can I process this and take some positive feedback out of it and go again? And can I keep failing until I actually succeed? So it's not only learning off someone. Now you can do this through books. You don't have to pay someone. You see, you can't genuinely do it through books. If you went on Google, you would learn everything, right? But it's the accountability. It is finding somebody who is who will hold you to accountability, who will check in on you. And then it's the environment because if they can do what I can do, it's that creates a response, a positive response going, well, no, do you know what? Fucking Luke's doing that. Actually, so that means I can do it. I didn't believe I can do it, but if Luke is from my town, he can do it. I can see that, type, that that's an attitude. But see, then that does bring me to attitude. How many good peop- people have a good attitude of taking information and applying it? People will... Talk a good story. I see them coming into my program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are 100% committed, Derek. And they do nothing. And you're there, man, you didn't do anything. Your attitude stinks. They will hit and miss. It is, what's discipline, Luke? Discipline is doing things we don't want to do. Over and over. It's like going to the gym. Over and over to get the body. Eating nutrition. Over and over to sculpt the body doing the mental work over and over to think clearly, to think accurately. So there's quite a mix in what I've said, because, but that is the harsh reality. It's not easy. And I don't want to be cheesy and go, oh, would everybody be successful? But I don't class myself as successful, but I'm building towards something. But I'm happy in the present moment with what I am doing. And most people are putting all their happiness somewhere in the future and they're looking at the Kardashians and going, oh, they're all building their life, but why don't you build your own life? Fuck the Kardashians or whatever you're looking at, reality TV, and do it for you. They're not people are stuck. It's that cycle. Whereas to come out of that, you have to feel the feelings. You have to nearly feel loneliness. You have to feel sadness. You have to feel anger. And then if you can do that for six weeks, and you stay on that course for three, four, five, six months, you'll go far. But most people can't do a month. I like that. That's something I've actually not heard. That last bit about the emotions that you feel in that six weeks period. It's the biggest thing. Yeah, that is, that's really good. I have felt that many a times on taking new paths, risks, and you know, failing, you know, failing forwards rather than failing backwards, all that kind of, you know, that I absolutely, I'm, I'm taking that, especially with anybody that's in a mindset on, I can't do this. I've tried everything. You know, maybe they are, they're not feeling, they're only feeling a certain way, and that's all they're used to. They're not used to feeling a different emotion. Oh. And then if they can work on that, the behavior shifts, the mindset, you, you, you know, and it goes on. And I think just how you've shared it, and this is why I love bringing people on like yourself onto this podcast is because it's your story. It's what you've written. It's, yeah. it's what's helped you become the man you are today. There's no, like you say, there's, there's going to be no right or wrong in how you've created it. What's worked for you is not going to necessarily work for somebody else. But as you know, we're, we're here, we're in the coaching industry. I, I know for myself, just like you did, you hired somebody, 
if they can do it, so can I. You sort of believe in yourself. I was the same. I have come into this industry to give back to people purely because my experience of having somebody guide me, right? So this this leads me on to a question that I love to ask every single guest on this <laughs> podcast. You can, you tell I've like questions. Um, so what does master in your life mean to you, Derek? Yeah, it means many things. I think I might have summed it up already, but to sum- summarize it in a snapshot, Master in your life is right. It's it comes down to two things for me, Luke. Right, what holds people back? And if we all consider what I'm about to say, people will dig their graves by how they think and how they self talk themselves. Right, so we'll hear this: "Oh, master your mind and all." But this master your mind means that it's actually how do you talk to yourself? So if you're going to talk in a certain certain way, do the opposite to what the voice says. Now, there's a lot of ways I'm not going to get into it right now, but Your thought process is everything. And it is actually in the moments I'm talking about where, you know, I I work a lot on state. And what we mean by that is the formula, this is a success formula, state, structure, content. It means your mood, where your energy is at. It means then the structure, which is the plan, and the content is the action. But two and three are bullshit because people will then operate on their feelings. Oh, I feel great today, so I'll go to the gym. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll send all those emails. But what about tomorrow when you've not slept or your child's been at what? You're not going to do fuck all then. You see, this is where state management is everything. And it's realizing a lot of your thoughts are bullshit and you've just got to proceed anyway. And how we proceed then is by using discipline, is by using focus and going, right, I'm going to do that uncomfortable thing. What happens when we do the uncomfortable thing? Oh, our state rises. Oh, this is crazy. I've now created a new belief because I used to not do that. So the next time it comes, you go, you won't want to do it, but you'll do it. Oh, state rises. Now you've got momentum, which is the currency, which will continually propel you forward. And then you'll have failure, but you won't mind failure because now you've already created belief because you've fucking been there and done it. That, to me, it summarizes. So I could listen, man. I think I would need another hour <laughs> to summarize it properly but i think if people follow that formula they do well listen it's feeling the feelings man um we cannot go from comfort zone to where we want to get which is going to be very uncomfortable and that will be an emotional a very emotional journey i think just in terms of you being that mindset coach and what you've shared there the formula of like the three things there that yeah. that's that's brilliant Again, that's something that I wasn't, I mean, I'd say I was, I've heard about it briefly, but it's how, you, again, it's just how you've put that together. And it's so good, that question. So, um, Derek, where where can people find you on the internet or social media? Come on, I know you're everywhere, but let people know where they can find you. Um, Instagram, listen, DRomedit, at DRomedit, so at D-R-O-W-E, M-E-T-H-O-D. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, Derek Rowe on Facebook and that's about it you can when you go on to Instagram you can find my website and stuff huge amounts of success stories being shared on my story this week. <laughs> ah love it love it well guys just make sure you give him a follow because Derek if you want straight talking if you want somebody who uh, goes against the grain he is 100% the guy to follow and watch uh, so all, all I want to conclude at the end of this Derek is thank you so much for everything you've shared on this podcast it's been an absolute pleasure having you on My absolute pleasure. Thanks, Luke, for having me on, man. Cheers, mate. Thank you so much for tuning in on this episode. If you found this useful and it's provided value to you, if you don't mind, go onto my channel, tap follow, and keep in the loop for more podcast episodes like this. And if you want to go one step further please leave us a positive review. It would mean the world to us and it would help spread the message to many more people. And also, if you want to go that one step further again, tag us on socials, drop us a message. I will always respond. Look forward to seeing you on the next one.